Hey, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you to our webinar for today. My name is William Tingle, and I'll be talking to you today about subject to uh, buying property subject to the existing financing. And uh, over time, we'll talk about subject to we'll talk about um, We'll uh, talk about creative financing and all those sorts of things. Uh, but uh, for right now, we're just going to kick off with the basics of subject two. If you're new here, uh, you know what subject two is, how it works, and that sort of thing. So uh, we'll get started. And uh, buying property subject to the existing financing. I actually call this the ultimate method of buying real estate. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, if maybe you don't have the best credit or you don't have the ability to uh, buy uh, properties from banks and that sort of thing, it works out real well. Uh, I've been doing this for about 21 years, and I'll tell you just a little bit uh, about what we're going to cover today. So today we'll cover uh, what subject two is or the sub two method. Uh, we'll talk about the advantages of using this method. There are a ton of them. Uh, some of the risk involved uh, there, you know, there are risk in pretty much everything that we do today. And subject two is certainly no different. Um, it does have certain risk, certain things that you may have heard of. Uh, maybe the due on sale clause. Is that a risk? We'll cover that. Uh, you know, the biggest risk really with buying subject two is pretty much the same risk that you're going to run into with any other form of real estate uh, acquisition, and that's going to be who you put in the house, the tenants, and that sort of thing. But but we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, is it legal? You know, in the 21 years I've been doing this, I've had uh, attorneys, real estate agents, all type of licensed professionals tell me that buying property subject to is illegal. It's absolutely not true, and we'll cover a few of those points as well today. Uh, where to find sub two deals? You know, pretty much any property that has a mortgage is really eligible to be a sub two deal, but there are specific places where you're more likely to run into these sort of deals. And we'll, uh, we'll go over all of that today. Uh, the importance of marketing, actually, uh, you know, we talk about sub two as being a form of financing where you, uh, a form of buying where you don't need financing. You don't actually have to have cash. You don't have to have the ability to get bank loans. And that's certainly true. Probably most of your expenditures will go out in education and in marketing. And we're going to talk about several different ways that you can market. Some of them low cost and some of them actually don't have much cost at all to them. So, so we'll cover those points. Uh, some of the myths surrounding subject two, uh, some of the things remember back when I said, uh, you know, some lawyers and agents will tell you it's not legal, you can't do it. Uh, but there are some other myths, and we'll go over those. And then sub two deals today. Uh, you know, like I said, I've been doing this for 21 years. I've been teaching it for about 17 or 18. And you know, some things have changed over the years. And so we're going to give you some deal examples here of some that we bought in the past, and then some of the stuff that we're that we're actually doing today, and how our business has changed. Now, we'll run through this, and every few slides, I'll stop the screen share, and. Uh, see if you guys have any questions. In the meantime, uh, if you have any questions, you can just type those uh, in the chat box and uh, I'll come to those when we stop every, every few uh, slides. So, so let me tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I worked in the red restaurant industry for over 20 years. That was sort of my career, uh, 70, 80 hours a week. If any of you guys out there have worked in the restaurant industry, you know exactly what I'm talking about, long hours, uh, I hadn't had a vacation in 10 years. Uh, you know, it's just really, it's a lot of hard work. And, uh, you know, you're just working for somebody else, just making a paycheck. And one night uh, I was out of town. I had a manager quit and um, I was having to fill in and I was up. It was two in the morning. I ordered a Carlton Sheets course. And there may be some of you guys out there uh, that are old enough to remember the Carlton Sheets infomercials. He was one of the first uh, guru type guys that had the late night uh, TV ads. I guess when people are up, they can't sleep. They're thinking about all the bills they can't pay and that sort of thing. Uh, he was actually, he ran a lot of commercials and I had seen it. I don't know how many times before, 
Uh, but that night I just, I reached over the phone was right there next to the bed. So I reached over, picked it up and, and called and ordered it. And, um, you know, I remember the day UPS brought the box. It had all the binders and the cassette tapes and, and all that sort of thing in there. And I remember opening that, taking the plastic off of it, opening it up and thinking, wow, I will never, ever learn all of this stuff. But, you know, I did something that probably statistically 99% of people that buy a course don't do. And that was, I actually opened it and I did what the guy said to do. And as a result, the next month, I bought my first investment property. Uh, and, you know, I said, well, that really wasn't so tough. You know, I, I, I did it by, you know, I didn't have a ton of money. So I did it by cold calling uh, FISBOs in the newspaper and finally found somebody who, uh, who, who showed an interest in, in giving me a little bit of a discount. I had good credit, didn't have a lot of money and got a small local bank to fund it for me, actually walked away from closing with a check for a little over $800. So I said, wow, this thing really works. You, know, you can buy property uh, with no money down. And, uh, and so and that's how we bought our, our first few investment properties. Uh, I quit my job and went full time the next August. You know, once we bought that first property, I said, hey, you know, I want to set some goals. And we talk a lot about goal setting. Uh, and, and that's what we did. You know, we charted a plan to make that happen. Uh, 10 years later, sort of semi-retired, moved to Belize and, uh, and then started buying a few properties remotely from Belize and did that for about nine years until last year, uh, when I moved back to the States, currently live in Colorado, uh, just got married last year. And, um, you know, we're buying houses remotely today. You know, to date, we've taken the deed to over 500 properties and done about 600 deals uh, just over the last 20 years or so. So, you know, not, I mean, I'm not a hundred house a month type guy. You know, you buy a couple of houses a month and, uh, and, and that's really all you need to, to, to really make a nice living. But that's just a little bit about my background. So, so let's really get into why you're here today. What is buying subject to? Well, when you buy a property subject to, you're purchasing it subject to the existing financing. And put just the most simply that you can, uh, this means that the loan or any other liens or encumbrances that are already on the property are going to stay there without any formal assumption on your part. Uh, you're going to uh, take the payment book and start sending in the payments just like the, the, the owner did previously, and the owner's going to deed the property to you. So yeah, that's really pretty much how it works. A lot of times we make contact with a seller, uh, listen to their story, and we just put it to them very simply. Well, listen, Mr. Seller, if I could make the payments for you until I can find a buyer that can get new financing, um, will that work? And depending on their situation, it absolutely will work. And a lot of times that's exactly how we buy our properties. So that's just how we do it. Uh, in this case, the uh, you own the property when they deed it to you and the seller still owns the loan. So that's really pretty much how it works. So, you know, I remember when I first heard about subject to and, and my thoughts, and you're probably, some of you are probably having the same ones. Why would anyone sell their property this way? Uh, well, divorce, does anybody where you live get a divorce? And a lot of times, a lot of our leads come from people getting divorced. Most people today, it requires two incomes uh, to uh, pay the bills. And if there's a divorce, now there's only one person and they just can't afford that house payment. So that's a really good source of leads. Uh, job transfer, one of our target and our favorite lists are VA loans. Why? Because most people come in to a VA loan. Uh, they don't put anything down. If you'll notice, if you use tools like PropStream, maybe to research properties, uh, you'll look and see where someone bought a house last year for two hundred thousand, and they financed two ten uh, on a VA loan situation because they let them roll a lot of those costs in. Uh, maybe they got orders after they'd been in the house for a year. They've got to move across the country. They don't have a lot of equity. They don't have enough equity to list with a realtor. Uh, they don't have the money to come out of pocket and list with a realtor. So uh, people in job transfer, especially in the military, are really good sources. Uh, death in the family. 
again, loss of an income, maybe just the memories associated with a the house. They just want to get rid of it. Hey, tired landlords, that's a huge one today, a huge target, just because uh, they have tenants in the property that aren't paying them. They can't do anything due to COVID. And if you're able to step in and take those uh, the burden of that house payment off of their hands, deal with that tenant. That's a lot of opportunity out there today. Job loss, again, loss of income. Uh, they bought another house and they just, you know, their realtor told them, hey, your house will sell super fast. So they bought another house. Now they're making two house payments. Really, there are as many reasons as there are sellers. Uh, uh, but these are some of the top ones. So, I learned about subject two after, you know, we bought our first three or four properties and uh, used bank financing to do that. And one of the reasons I got into real estate was because I wanted to replace my, my job income. And what I learned as, as I moved along in the real estate process was that uh, most banks, even if they'll finance you, if you've got good credit, maybe you've got a little money to put down. Most banks have a limit to the number of properties that they're going to let you buy. Uh, they don't want to be overexposed, I believe is the term they use, uh, which basically just means you owe them too much money. If something happened and you couldn't pay, you would owe them a lot of money and they didn't want that much risk. So, you know, I, I learned very quickly that bank financing wouldn't fill the need for the, for the income that I wanted. So I knew there had to be another way. I tried the lease option stuff and we did a couple of those deals, but they seemed to have a whole lot of potential for problems when you're stuck in the middle between the actual seller and your buyer and your seller goes around you to deal with your buyer, just some things that, that I really didn't like about it. And I learned about subject two and uh, I thought, wow, you know, people will actually deed you their property and stay responsible for the mortgage. But you know what? It happens every single day. Uh, so not, interestingly enough, uh, it's just like uh, that, that thing that happens when you buy a new red sports car and then I'll, you never saw them before, but now all of a sudden they're everywhere. I started finding opportunities for sub two. So uh, my first sub two deal came not too long after that. My seller actually called on a bandit sign that we had put out. And as you'll hear me say, uh, the deal is almost always in the story. Uh, this guy's story was that he and his wife, they were a very young couple with a small child. They had uh, gotten married and bought this brand new house. Their parents had gifted them the $5,000 down payment money. So they didn't really have anything in it. They had lived in the house for less than a year and now they were getting a divorce. And, uh, so they had zero equity basically in the house. Um, so this guy owed 104,000, he had a 7% mortgage, which was very good at the time. And, uh, I went out to meet with him. She had moved out. There wasn't any furniture left in the house. He basically lived in there and slept on a mattress. And so I walked around, listened to his story and, and just kind of fumbled through it. Like I said, this was my first. And I said, well, listen, uh, you know, Joe, if I could make the payments for you until I could get a buyer with that work. And he said, man, that would be great if you could do that. So we signed the deal up. We marked the house up uh, to sell it on a land contract. And that's just selling with seller financing. So uh, there was very little equity in this house. Realistically, it was probably worth around 110, uh, maybe 115. So we marked it up just a little bit. Uh, and sold it with terms. We collected a $13,000 down payment from our buyer. We financed them at eight and three quarter percent interest. And we collected a whopping $161 a month in cash flow for 26 months until they refinanced us. Uh, at the time, like I said, I was brand new into this and didn't know much about setting interest rates and what a good cash flow was. I thought $161 a month on a free house was great. Uh, so we took it. The guy, the uh, buyer stayed in there for a little over two years, got him a new loan, and uh, our total profit over 27 months was almost $27,000. So it uh, seemed like a pretty sweet deal to me at the time, I'll tell you. Uh, that was our first one. I remember the day that I went and picked up uh, my check for the down payment. I even, I was so new, I paid half of the attorney's closing cost. Uh, but uh, we bought that property. I collected almost 13, the whole $13,000 as the down payment. 
which was more than I was making in two months at my job. And uh, I was a pretty happy camper at the time. So that was a much younger me 20 years ago. So uh, we were convinced that real estate worked. Absolutely. So, so what are the advantages really of buying subject to? Well, uh, number one, no banks are needed. As I said earlier, if you have bad credit, if you uh, don't have any money, uh, you can still buy houses. You can buy all you want. Uh, advantage number two, low or no closing cost. Uh, you know, after doing this for a while, I learned that your buyer will pretty much pay all the closing cost. As you can see from uh, from the check that I showed, the total closing cost on my transaction, for 200, my side was $250, so not very much at all. And uh, super fast closing time. You know, if you've got somebody that's down to the wire a couple of days before the foreclosure auction, they want to do a deal with you, you've got the, the ability to do it. Try to go out and buy a house with bank financing in just a couple of days. It just doesn't happen. Again, good credit's not needed. It doesn't show up on your credit report. Uh, if you have good credit, uh, you don't have uh, 10 mortgages that you've taken over payments on showing up as liabilities on your credit report. So that's a great thing. Uh, the, the, my next one is one of my favorites, and that's the low homeowner interest rates. Now, you know, even as an investor with great credit, uh, you're going to pay a higher interest rate than a homeowner that has good credit. It's, it's absolutely nothing to take over payments now on mortgages with two, two and a half, three percent interest rates. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And the cash flow that you can make with those is just great. So that's a big advantage. And the biggest advantage is, uh, advantage is that owning the property with long term fixed rate financing in place means that your exit strategies or just whatever you want them to be. A lot of times, if you buy from small local banks, you're going to have a 36-month balloon. Uh, even larger banks for investment property, a lot of times, won't go over 15 years. We absolutely take over payments all the time on properties that have full 30-year fixed-rate mortgages on them. That means it's low payments, uh, low interest rates. If you want to rent that thing out forever, you can. If you want to sell it with seller financing with no balloon, you can. You can just do all of those things. So it means if you want to rent it, if you want to sell it with seller financing, you can do pretty much whatever you want to with it. So we'll take a break here and see if anyone uh, has any questions that they would like to ask in the chat box. Uh, you're perfectly uh, 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 you know, available to do that. Uh, we'll wait for just a second and see if anybody does have any of those questions. And if not, we'll just go back to the presentation. Okay, so looks like we don't have any questions. If you guys do have questions, uh, you can ask those, like I said, and uh, we'll stop every few slides and come back and uh, get those answered for you. Uh, so, is buying subject to legal? Uh, and, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say, uh, buying subject to it and legal, what about the due on sale clause? And let me just tell you a little bit about the due on sale clause. Uh, the due on sale clause isn't a law, so to speak. It is a contract agreement that the buyer actually makes with the bank that says they won't transfer title without the bank's approval. The due on sale clause gives banks the right at their option to call the loan due upon transfer of title or beneficial interest in the property with a few exceptions, okay? Such as transferring title into a land trust for estate planning purposes. Uh, it's not a law, there's no due on sale jail. Uh, it's simply a contractual agreement that the, the seller, that the buyer makes with the bank. So just the fact that uh, the seller decides to transfer title doesn't mean there will be a due on sale uh, clause exercised. It just means the bank has the option to do so. And if you'll read a mortgage uh, or deed of trust or whatever your state security document may be, uh, and look for the due on sale uh, provision in there. 
you'll find out that that's the case. It actually says at their option. And if anyone tries to tell you that sub two is illegal, just ask them about line 203 or 503 on a standard HUD or uh, uh, any other closing document where it clearly says existing loans taken subject to. It's all in there. It's in the document. Uh, it's been done forever and there's nothing illegal about it. So uh, where do I like to look for sub two deals? Our favorite places uh, to find these deals today are MLS expired and soon to expire listings. Now, <clears throat> I know that investors for years and years have looked at expired listings. Uh, in most of the markets we work in today, uh, they're pretty hot. I know I live in Colorado Springs right now where we've got 20% appreciation and less than a seven day inventory of property. So MLS expired listings are pretty rare. Now, what you'll find more often uh, are listings that have been on the market for just a little while. And I call these soon to expire listings. And a lot of times we'll uh, fire a postcard out to some of those that have been listed for 60 or 90 days. And it just says something simple like, hey, I noticed your house has been on the market for a bit and hasn't sold. And if your listing expires without a sale, or for some reason you cancel your contract with your agent, give us a call. We're very interested in talking to you about buying. And what I'm really just trying to do is locate the people that really, really need to sell. If, if they've got the luxury of just a little bit of time, chances are their property is going to sell. But if they're in a divorce situation, if they haven't made house payments in a couple of months, uh, or something like that, then they may reach out to us and say, hey, we really need to sell this house now. What can you do? And so, I mean, it really is a numbers game. And 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 we don't uh, text these people and call them relentlessly and that sort of thing. We'll send one postcard and see what we can shake out from there. But that's, that's one of the things we do. Uh, Pre-foreclosures, uh, pre-COVID, we would have 75 to 100 foreclosures in El Paso County on a monthly basis. And the number's down to about 11 right now. So uh, pre-foreclosures were probably 50% of our business prior to COVID. So that's been a lot more tougher. Are there still foreclosures out there? Well, sure they are. Uh, but again, it's uh, that the, the haystack that you have to look at is much bigger now. So you have to work a little bit harder for those. Uh, bankruptcies, divorce, and tired landlords. Lords. They're a lot more uh, fruitful now than before uh, with the pre-foreclosures being pretty much gone. Uh, tired landlords is a big target right now. People, small-time landlords that had a couple of properties, uh, maybe they've got some people that aren't paying, uh, approaching them and asking them if they want to get rid of that problem property. Uh, a couple of new things that we've started using a little bit more recently are real estate agents and mortgage brokers. You know, most people aren't aware that uh, as many as 70% of people that go in to uh, refinance their house can't do it either because they're behind on payments or they, they're they self-employed or they uh, don't have the credit history needed because uh, lending is so tight right now. The credit scores they require and, and they're just so stringent in their requirements that 70% uh, or more of people can't get refinanced. And in those cases, mortgage brokers can be a really good referral for people that need to sell their property. But the important thing to remember, even though there are some targets that are better, uh, the important thing to remember is almost any deal can be a sub two deal. Really, all you need is a motivated seller and an existing mortgage. If you've got those two things available, uh, you know, you've got the potential for that kind of deal. So. Let's go to marketing. Uh, you know, consistent marketing uh, is, is a really important part of your success, being very constant with it. And over the years, we've done all sorts of different kinds of marketing. Uh, you know, I took an old Chevy Blazer uh, that we got for next to nothing and uh, had it painted and, and parked it all over town. We did that. We got a bunch of calls from that sort of thing. Uh, we tried uh, billboards for a while. Yeah, it was very expensive, wasn't super productive. Some of the best leads came from just things like business cards. We put business cards everywhere. We stopped and got gas, put them on top of the gas pumpers. If you're in Walmart or any other store, uh, in caps, uh, customer service counters, 
if you're putting them on the gas pumps, don't forget the credit card slots. You guarantee somebody will see that one. Uh, the magnetics on your car. If you're not using magnetics, I mean, they're super inexpensive, 30 bucks for a pair of them. And, uh, you know, and, and they'll get a lot of calls. Don't forget the back of the car too. the tail. Like if you're driving a truck, the tailgate of the truck, uh, that's a good spot. You have a lot more people riding behind you and things like that. Uh, bandit signs, you know, people say bandit signs don't work. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, I ran the RIA in Macon, Georgia, when I lived in Georgia for 12 years. And man, I had people putting signs out all over the place. I mean, it was common to see this sort of thing, but don't let that deter you. Uh, put your signs up there too, because I, and this is a funny thing about bandit signs. Uh, you can see those, and, and, and I travel a good bit, and I try to make a point of any town that I'm in. If I see a bandit sign, pick up the phone, call the number. And I'm looking for a couple of things. One is just a network with another investor. Hey, what's going on in your area? What's working? How are things going? Uh, you bought a lot of houses. Um, but the second thing I'm looking for is, are they even answering the phone? And I'll tell you, it's, a, it's interesting, but probably 75% uh, or better of the time, they won't answer the phone. And if you leave a message, they won't call you back. Um, so, you know, they go to the expense of doing this, uh, of the busy work, but don't make sure that they're talking to sellers. And that's what's really important, the whole thing. If you're not talking to sellers, uh, you're not going to be buying any houses. So put out the signs, make sure you're answering the phone. So somebody calls you on your bandit sign or one of your marketing uh, techniques. So what are the some key questions to determine the degree of motivation from your seller? Because remember what I said earlier, most of the time the deal is in the story. Yeah. So some of the questions we ask, of course, we're interested in the house, but you know, we're looking for a cellar, not so much a house. A house is a house is a house generally. It's got bedrooms, bathrooms, a living room, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. But it's why the seller's motivated. So the, some of the questions we ask, well, hey, I'm, I'm looking at your house here, Don. It looks great. It looks like a super nice house. But can you tell me why you're selling? And interestingly enough, most people will tell you, well, I'm getting a divorce and can't afford the payment on my own, or, well, we haven't made the payment in six months and we're in foreclosure. Now, most people will tell you, uh, what are you hoping to accomplish by selling the house? Well, you know, I'm just trying to get this payment off my back. Um, okay, well, it, so how soon would you like to get this done? And the sooner the better. If they tell you things like, well, we're not in a hurry, we got plenty of time, it, you know, six months, it doesn't matter, tomorrow. I'm looking for somebody that says, I want this done right away. How fast can we get this done? I've got to move across the country next week. I don't want to have this second house payment on me. Or, well, you know, we're going to be in foreclosure next month. If we don't get it taken care of, we'd like to get it taken care of right away. So those are some of the things that I'm looking for. And when I hear these things, I'm going to go back to the question that we talked about earlier. If I were able to make the payments on the house for you until I could find a buyer, would that work for you? And you've already heard the story, so you already probably know, um, you know, that it will work. You know the answer to the question before you ever ask it. So uh, that's kind of the process for, you know, how we determine whether they would be open to what we are going to present and, and finding out if they would be. So we'll, uh, we'll stop the share here again and see if anybody has any questions. Uh, doesn't uh, look like there are any questions in the box, so we'll go uh, back to the presentation. Okay, a lot of people associate um, um, subject two with just the pretty house business. Uh, it's just a matter of either buying it sub two and renting it out or selling it with seller financing, which is what we like to do. But you can do a whole lot of other things with sub two. Uh, you can flip them. Here's an example of a property that we flipped. Uh, this guy, you talk about stories. This guy had a story. Um, I was actually out driving around, driving for dollars one Saturday morning, and uh, I got lost, and I was uh, turning around in his driveway, and he was coming down the driveway to get his newspaper. Uh, had a Budweiser in his hand, and it was probably about 8 o'clock in the morning. His, uh, he was telling me, he said, hey, do you buy houses? And I said, well, yeah, that's what these signs say. And uh, he said, well, I need to sell this one. My wife uh, got transferred to Tennessee, and 
uh, you know, I've, I've been living here trying to sell the house. And so anyway, his wife had already moved out of the state and he was left to sell the house and he didn't have a sign in the front yard. He didn't have the house listed. So I don't know if he was in a great big hurry to get it done, but opportunity presented itself. So he told me his story. Uh, he had a Bank of America loan with a 13% interest rate, which made the payments not attractive for me for our normal exit, which is seller financing. Uh, but he had a lower loan balance. He had some equity in the house. You know, the house was prob probably worth uh, around 130, 140,000. And he just wanted to get out of it. So uh, we walked through it. It needed paint and carpet, uh, you know, $10,000 tops for some little repairs and things. And uh, I said, well, hey, uh, you know, we can take over the payments if that'll work. And he said, yeah, it'll get me out of here. Let's do it. So we did it. His payments were current. Uh, we uh, we actually closed on the the sale there, found a marketed it, found a buyer that wanted to earn some sweat equity. And so we actually sold it to them. They brought in their own financing. We sold it for 105 and made over $14,000 in just a little over a month on it, just flipping it. So uh, you can certainly flip a sub two deal. Uh, here's another type of, of flip. My attorney called me up one day and said, hey, William, said, I've got this lady in here. We're doing her her estate for her probate. And uh, her mom just died and left her a house and uh, she wants to sell hers. So uh, we gave her a call and this, this was a super interesting story here. This lady had owned this house for 25 years and she only had five years left on the mortgage. Uh, and only owed uh, $14,000. And the house was probably worth uh, 65 or, or 70, maybe. Uh, just a little three bedroom, two bath job. Uh, but when I went out there to see the house, she, her mom had been sick for several months and she had been living with her, taking care of her. And the only occupants for this house for the last year, pretty much, had been about 10 dogs and 20 cats. And uh, to say this house was in interesting shape, I guess, was an understatement. But the bottom line on it is we bought it subject to, we didn't give her a nickel. She didn't want it. Her, her mom had left her a house free and clear, and she just wanted out. And uh, uh, as soon as we, we signed the contract on it, you see the, the lawnmower there in the front yard, uh, I took my handyman over there the next day to cut the grass. The grass was, you see, it was pretty tall. And uh, he started cutting the grass and the neighbor came over and said, hey, said, uh, I didn't know this house was for sale or I would have bought it. And I said, well, hey, you can still buy it. And uh, he, we, we actually flipped it to him the next day for, for $29,000. So we made a quick 15 on that. And I, th I think my handyman had cut uh, two swipes in the grass. And I told him, hey, Anthony, we just we just sold this house. So he loaded his lawnmower up and, and we we took off. So. Uh, looks like we might have a question here, so we'll stop this for a, a second. Uh, okay, Brenda, when buying subject to, have you ever been required to provide the seller with any funds from the sale? You know, there are times um, when we have given seller proceeds, uh, not necessarily from the sale. We usually make that deal with them up front. And what we do is, uh, like, let's say, for example, you've got somebody that's got a hundred thousand dollar house that they owe uh, seventy on, and they say, "Hey, you know, we want ten thousand dollars out of this deal to do it." And will we do it? Absolutely, we will. If I can buy, you know, just keeping the numbers simple, if I can buy a hundred thousand dollar house for seventy and give the seller ten, buy a hundred thousand dollar house for eighty, I'll do that all day long. And really. All we're going to do is give our buyers money to the seller. I'll, I'll sell that hundred thousand dollar house for uh, one fifteen or one nineteen, get ten, eleven, twelve thousand dollars down, and just turn around and give that to my seller, and uh, you know, pocket whatever little difference is left, and then start collecting that cash flow. So, absolutely, Brenda, great question. Sometimes we do pay the sellers. Sometimes they get cash up front uh, when we do the deal, and sometimes they wait on it until our buyer actually cashes out. It just depends on their motivation level and uh, what it is that, uh, that they want to, to do or are willing to do. So good question. Um, so just some interior shots of, of this house. Uh, I call it the cat dog house because it was so full of, of animals and everything. But yeah, it was a pretty interesting place. This, is, this was definitely 
uh, not a pretty house for sure. It's I always say when I show this house, it's too bad that PowerPoint doesn't have a scratch and sniff feature because it was it was pretty gnarly. Uh, but anyway, yeah, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about um, soon to expire. I call them soon to expire listings, and they're listings that have been in the MLS over half of their listing time, but they still haven't sold. And a lot of times you'll find a motivated seller there. Uh, here's an example of one. We sent one of those postcards to this one. It had been listed for over 90 days and it just said, hey, notice your house has been on the market for a while, hasn't sold. And uh, if your listing expires or for some reason uh, you and your agent end your contract, give us a call. This guy, I believe he probably walked from his mailbox to his telephone and called us. And it turns out he was in pre-foreclosure. He was four months behind. Now, the interesting thing about this house, this guy had accepted a job in another state and he had done all the things that most people do. He called an agent and said, hey, I want to sell my house. And she came out and looked at it and said, well, you need to put new carpet in it. You need to paint the interior and uh, and we'll list it for you. But those are the things that it needs. So he did it. This house was in like brand new condition. Uh, but he so he spent a lot of the money that he had and he moved and it didn't sell. They had priced it a little bit over market, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, more than it should have been. And uh, it just sat there. And so by the time he got the card for me, uh, the job hadn't worked out in his new location. He was broke and he didn't know what to do. He was paying on an apartment there. He couldn't make his house payment and he just didn't know what to do. Now he had a VA loan with a mortgage balance of only $48,000. Uh, he was on the backside of a 15-year note, had seven years left. Uh, the payments were $800 a month, but over half of it was going to principal. I mean, it was amazing. And uh, so, you know, I made the guy an offer and I said, well, what, what do you say? I mean, because, you know, you just, you make an offer and they'll tell you if it works. Uh, we knew we'd have to make up back payments. And uh, I asked him if he'd take $3,000 and sign off on it. And he said, no. Uh, I, I need to have 3,500. So we went ahead and did that deal with him. Uh, all we did in this case, we had a beautiful house with a ton of equity and we just slashed the price of the house. So they had it listed for, I think, if I remember correctly, a little over a hundred. Uh, I relisted it with my realtor and we knocked the price down to 91,000 and we got it under contract pretty quickly and made over $36,000. I think I was only in this house twice. Um, it was, uh, you know, we just listed it and let the agent take care of it. And uh, But a lot of times what you'll find, especially in, in dealing with these soon to expire listings, uh, most people don't tell their agent what the problem is. You know, if the, if the seller had told the agent, listen, I'm four payments behind, they're going to foreclose on me. You know, maybe she would have suggested, let's just lower the price. Okay, let's get this thing sold. But she didn't and he didn't. And we sent them a card and we were in the right place at the right time. So that's just the way it works out. Uh, here's a, another example of a, a little rehab retail we did. This was a, a pre-foreclosure uh, that the seller again called us on a postcard. They'd owned the house for 15 years. They were six months behind on the mortgage payments. P-I-T-I -I, were $411,000. And we're talking about an $80,000 house here. Uh, he owed $30,000 on the mortgage. He only wanted $3,000 to move. Uh, and uh, it needed about $8,000. It needed paint and carpet and a couple of little minor repairs that we took care of in a couple of weeks. Um, we paid $4,800 to the bank, brought it current, gave the seller $3,000, and sold the house for $82,000 and uh, made another $32,000 in uh, less than 90 days. So there, there are all kinds of things. You can rehab, you can use, you can take over payments sub two, rehab and retail your property. You can flip them uh, just like you would flip any other property, uh, except your holding costs are going to be making payments on the underlying mortgage. It's a lot cheaper than hard money. Uh, the financing's already in place. And uh, so don't, don't just think about it in terms of pretty houses. Now, the, the fact of the matter is that's pretty much all we do today are pretty houses. We've kind of got a cookie cutter system that we use right now. And uh, so I want to show you some of those. These are the deals that we do today, uh, day in and day out.
here's a pre foreclosure example. This is a house we bought last year uh, from a guy, and uh, this is kind of how it went. Uh, it was a pre foreclosure. Uh, it was right before uh, COVID started. Uh, this guy owed $154,000. Uh, 3.38% interest. Okay. Uh, he was on a 30 year term. We gave, we paid 3000 to reinstate. He was only a couple of payments behind and we gave him $5,000 and then we spent $2,000 cleaning this thing up. Now our payments are seven ninety five dollars a month on this property. And we immediately sold it on a contract for deed. That's how we do our seller financing is contract for deed. It's really common in Georgia and uh, some other states or a couple of states that kind of give it the side eye like Texas. Uh, but contract for deed uh, works in the markets that we work in. That's where we keep legal title and our buyer gets equitable title. Now, our buyer gave us 15000 down on this house, which is a little bit less than we normally take, but it was a qualified buyer. Uh, and we liked them. So we took a little bit less down. Normally on something like this, we'd get 20,000 or so, about 10%. Uh, we, we financed the balance of 184 at 8% on a 40 year note. Uh, that's something else that we do in our seller finance uh, to create more of a back end and a bigger spread uh, is we finance our buyers on 40 year notes. And it does a couple of things. It makes their payment just a little bit less. And like I said, you know, more time with the interest spread. Uh, take note that we bought this house on a 3.38% loan and we sold it on 8%. Now, the difference in that interest and the difference in the amount that we have on our loan balance and our buyer has on their loan balance makes that spread get larger each month that we make payments and they make payments. So the back end uh, payment payoff is bigger. Uh, a lot of people will say you can't finance longer than 30 years because of Dodd-Frank, but that's not true. If you pay attention to Dodd-Frank, you'll see that they don't mandate uh, your terms with seller financing. If you want to finance somebody on a 50 or 60 year note and your buyer's agreeable, you can do it. But we, as a rule, do a, a 40 year note. Now our buyer's payments are $12.79 a month, and that gives us almost a $500 a month cash flow. And our typical buyer will refinance us out in about 36 months, and our payoff on this one will be around $41,000. So let's look at a profit breakdown on this deal. We made $5,000 up front, okay, and that's fifteen dollars we got down from our buyer and the $10,000 that we spent to get in, and that's paying our, our seller a little bit of cash, making up back payments and then any fix up that we had to do. Now we'll make about $18,000 in cash flow over 36 months, the time it takes our average contract for deed buyer to get new financing. And then a $41,000 back end when their payoff is 182 and ours is 141. So what we'll, we'll make on this pre foreclosure property that we picked up from a postcard, about $64,000. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and then you'll have people that say, what about houses that have no equity? Now, the last one we talked about had a little bit of equity. So what about properties that don't have equity? And typically, uh, that's probably 90% or better of the deals that we do, or what I call low or no equity. And that's when they're going to have less than 10%. If you're talking about a $200,000 house, you're going to be paying 180 or better for that. So how do you make money on those, really? Uh, well, here's an example of one we bought last winter, and this is how it worked. Uh, we actually had uh, somebody with a Driving for Dollars app that took a picture of it and sent it to us. So we uh, skip traced and found the, the owner. Uh, it's a $120,000 vacant property in like new condition. Uh, we bought it for the loan balance of 117. So this was literally 99% financed. Okay. Uh, they had a four and a quarter percent VA loan. They were one year into it. Uh, again, remember the deals in the story. Uh, this couple had bought a property. They had married, uh, bought a property VA. Uh, he had gotten uh, sent overseas. And while he was gone, uh, they decided to divorce. So uh, she, you know, they never lived in the property together, really. There were just a few boxes, no, really no furniture in there at all. Like I said, it was like new. 
uh, and uh, so they were you know ready to sell. The payments were five seventy seven, and we sold this house with owner financing. We marked it up about ten percent. And we sold it for sell, with seller financing for one thirty five. Our buyer gave us ten thousand down, and we financed the one twenty five at nine percent again on a forty year note. Now our buyer's payments are nine sixty four a month, and that gives us three hundred eighty seven dollars a month in cash flow. And then using the formula that most of our our buyers follow, in thirty six months they'll pay us off, and the payoff will be about thirteen thousand dollars. So. How does your profit work out on a no equity deal? Uh, 10000 up front. We had zero back payments to make up and the seller didn't want anything. They knew the house was fully leveraged. Uh, $14,000 in cash flow over 36 months and a $13,000 back end payoff. Put your total profit on a zero equity deal at $37,000. So as you can see, you can still buy uh, no equity deals and make money. So what about the do on sale clause? And I come back to this because this seems to be a real sticking point for a lot of new investors. They really fear the do on sale clause. So let me just give you a few facts about it. Uh, one of the things that, that I did was, you know, I dealt with several banks and uh, did some financing with some of them. And, and I just, I would ask them, uh, what would you guys do if I called you up and said, hey, uh, you know, I just bought Joe's house. You know, I know he wasn't paying you and we're going to take over the payments and we're going to make payments until we can find a buyer that can do this. And every one of them, that was big banks, small banks, BB&T, Bank of America, small little banks. Uh, and they all told me the same thing. Uh, as long as the payments are being made, we really don't care. Now, we know what the book says on it, that what you're not supposed to do. But, you know, we just don't care. We just want to get paid. So now, will that change if interest rates go through the roof? Maybe. But that's not going to happen overnight. You know, right now, uh, somebody with decent credit uh, can walk into a bank. If they've got a down payment, they can get a loan in the three, three and a half percent range. Uh, pretty, it's pretty common. But okay, so what if interest rates go to like they were in the 80s? What if they're 20%? Well, you may have some banks call some loans due at that point, but you're not going to wake up tomorrow and interest rates be 20%. They're going to go up half a point next month and next quarter, they'll go up a you know, quarter point. Uh, so, so there's going to be a process to that happen. And if you start seeing that happen, and then you might start paying a little bit closer attention but that's not going to be something that happens tomorrow. Now, another thing a lot of people aren't aware of is that Fannie Mae must give authorization to any lender or loan servicing company before they can exercise a due on sale on any government backed loan. Okay. They've got to say it's okay. So there's got to be a reason. It's just not randomly done. You know, I've bought over 500 properties subject to over the last 20 years, and I've never, ever had a lender say anything to me about the do on sale clause. Uh, in fact, I do a podcast called the Sub2 Deal Show. And uh, last year, I, I posted everywhere I could, Facebook, all over the place. And I say, if you actually know of a do on sale issue that has happened with an investor, please contact me so I can have you on the show to talk about it. So I put that out there. And over a couple of weeks, and I had a few people reach out to me and say, yeah, we've heard of this, a cousin of a friend of a friend. I had one guy that actually had personal experience with it, and it was a small regional bank in Arkansas. Uh, so they paid close attention to their loans. They knew, you know, that sort of what was going on, because like I said, they were a small bank that operated in that state. Uh, it wasn't like it was a huge, you know, lending institution, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, that sort of thing. So his case was a little bit unusual. So will it happen with a smaller bank? The chances are greater it can. Does it happen commonly? No, it doesn't. So uh, the do on sale clause is certainly not something that bothers me or something that keeps me awake. So We've gone through all this to say, okay, what is the secret of buying subject to? I get that question sometimes. There's got to be some you know, tips, tricks. Yeah, there, there, there's always something 
uh, you know, that you need to do. But here's the real secret. And it's the same secret any other method of investing has. Uh, know your technique. E education is key. Subject two is not complicated, uh, but it does have some moving parts. And you do need to know how to do these things properly, how to fill out the paperwork, what documents that you're going to need, that sort of thing, when they need to be filed, what the process is for buying and selling. You know, there's some steps that you need to take and you need to know those. Uh, plan and execute consistent marketing because bringing those leads in is what's important. And I see you guys putting some questions in the chat box and we're going to hit those up in just a minute and, and take a few minutes for some questions as well. Uh, learn to recognize a motivated seller. You know, don't try to chase people down that aren't motivated. Get the story. The story's where the deal is. Uh, do your deals for the right reasons. Don't set a goal of buying five houses next month and just run out and just try to buy five houses. Make each one of your deals, let the numbers decide for you. Don't step into a deal that's not a deal. Don't make somebody else's problem your problem. Uh, make your deals for the right reasons. Uh, this one's key. Treat people with respect. A lot of times we buy houses from people who are in stressful situations, whether it's divorce, whether it's foreclosure, whether it's losing their job, death in the family. And I see people all the time say, hey, they need you a lot more than you need them. And you don't have to this and that. Listen, you have to treat these people with respect. OK, they're in a bad situation and you're not out there to take advantage of them. In fact, we first approach most people, you know, with a heart to help people that are in foreclosure. If their situation's changed and they can afford their payments now, we'll try to work out a forbearance with the bank for them or try to work out some kind of loan modification. If they can keep their house, it's great. Uh, and, you know, the karma aspect of it, you know, so try to try to work things out where you can help somebody first. Disclose, disclose, disclose. You're taking over the payments. You're not going to pay off the loan today. Yes, the loan will still stay in their name. Yes, it can impact their, their credit or, and other things in the future. It's important that they know uh, what they're getting into. They're going to be sort of in business with you for however long it takes you to get that property sold. So make sure you're honest with them up front. And the last and most important secret is to take action. Remember what I told you about when I got that Carlton Sheets course? Uh, and actually tore the plastic off of it and opened it up and started using it, that is the real key here. Have you talked to a seller today? Because if you haven't talked to a seller, you haven't got any closer to buying a house. So the question is, will you take action today to achieve your financial freedom? Uh, you know, this time next year, where will you be? Will you be one step closer to being free? or just in the same place that you are today. I want to thank you guys. And like I said, we're going to get to these questions. Uh, if you need help anytime, you can contact me at the website. We've got tons of articles and tools to help you at sub2deals.com. The Sub2 Forum is our absolutely free Facebook group. Uh, join our group. We answer questions there every day. Also do the podcast, the Sub2 Deals podcast. You can find us on YouTube. Uh, or at Sub2 Deals Podcast. We'll answer questions for you. And we're always talking to real investors about what's working in their market and that sort of thing. They're all free resources for you. So anyway, we'll get over here to the chat questions. Okay, Brenda posted a link to the podcast, uh, sub2podcast.com. Uh, Colleen says, what happens when the homeowner wants to buy another property? How do they get approved with the existing mortgage debt uh, remains on their debt obligate? Is their debt obligation? Well, that's going to depend on some things, Colleen. First of all, uh, you know, I don't know what their credit score is going to be or what their debt to income ratios are or their job situation is going to be. I can't make them any promises. Uh, we do provide them with everything that we possibly can to help them get that loan, including copies of the HUD, statements from us showing that we're making the payments. And we also have a form that can be provided to the lender uh, that we actually have for free in the forum section. If you go to sub2forum.com, that'll take you to our free Facebook group 
We've got tons of free forms and stuff in there. Uh, this is a form specifically for the mortgage person that explains exactly what's happened, that they've sold their property, that we're responsible for the payments, the taxes, insurance, and maintenance. And that can be really helpful too. That form was actually put together by a mortgage broker that's in our group. Uh, and he shared that with us as something that you can use to explain kind of what happens. Uh, Brenda, what additional educational material do you recommend for a newbie who's interested in this niche? Um, we offer a training program as well as a coaching group. But the first thing you want to do is jump in our free group at Sub2 Forum. It doesn't cost you a dime. And I answer questions there each and every day. And there, there are over 6,000 people in our group right now there uh, that can get you started. Uh, if you need to. Uh, Colleen says, can you help a homeowner save their house but remain and rent back? Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, what we try to do is, is help them, like let's say that, that Joe lost his job and he got two or three payments behind, but now he's got another job, maybe it's a better job, but he's afraid to talk to the bank. If we walked in on a situation like that, we'd make that call for him because a lot of times homeowners in foreclosure are just afraid. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to handle it. But these days, a call to the bank will almost certainly get you in forbearance. And a lot of times you can get a loan mod where it can put what the balance of what they owe on the back of the loan or something like that. Joe can start making his house payments again, keep his house. He's happy. We've done a good deed. Didn't cost us but a little bit of time. A lot of good karma there, too. So. Uh, but as far as recommending uh, taking over the payments and letting them rent it back, I wouldn't want to be in that position uh, because, uh, you know, if they got, they'll be happy with you in the moment, but later on, if they decide that, especially if the house had equity, that, uh, that you snookered them in some way, that's not a place you'd want to be. So uh, Brenda said, can you provide the link to your website and Facebook page? Uh, yes, uh, the website is sub2deals.com. I'll go back to that slide when we, when I get through answering the questions, just SUB, the number two deals.com. The Facebook page is sub2forum.com. I bought that URL. It'll take you to the Facebook page. SUB, the number two forum.com. Colleen said, what is your top recommended strategy for someone who's looking for only a few deals, not a full-blown business? I want to help people get into homes that can't compete with this crazy market buyers. I, I get you. In fact, one of the things that I teach my students is something I call uh, 12 Houses to Freedom. And I show them how you can create a half million dollar a year business in 36 months buying 12 houses a year. 12 houses a year is all it takes, Colleen. Uh, come over to the forum. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to do one of these webinars on that, the 12 houses to freedom. So you'd be looking for that uh, in one of our upcoming shows. It's, it's a great way to do it. You don't have to buy 20 houses a month to be successful in this business. You can buy one $200,000 house a month, every month for three years and be making a half million dollars a year. Um, well, thank you, Brenda. I appreciate you being here. Um, thanks, Colleen. Yeah, I, you know, helping first. Yeah, that, that's really, I mean, we're, we're really fortunate in this business. Like I said, I've been doing this uh, uh, for 21 years. And, uh, you know, we, it's been a good business for us. We, we, it, we've really been blessed. And, and just being able to help some other people, too, is a good thing. Oh, hey, glad you joined the group. So, yeah. Great. Okay. I'm going to show that slide. If y'all got any more questions, just pop them in here. Uh, I'm going to show that last slide again so you can get the, uh, the links to stuff if you don't have it. And uh, I appreciate each and every one of y'all for being on here. Like I said, we're going to we're going to come on here every month and try to teach you guys. I want to start with a little bit of the basics today for people that didn't know about Sub2 and what you can do with it. It's not just a pretty house business. You can, it's just a, it's just a method of acquisition. It's just really, you're, you're, it's just financing you're picking up that you're just taking over. It's, uh, it's great. You can buy as many houses as you want. And uh, I mean, it at better terms than you'd ever get as an investor. So uh, again, I appreciate you guys being here. And uh, if I can help you in any way, just reach out to me. You can contact me at William at sub2deals.com. Reach out to me in the forum. That's uh, Sub2 Forum. That's our Facebook group. And uh, we'd love it if you'd subscribe to our podcast. You can do that at Apple Podcast or on our website or 
subscribe to our YouTube channel. We do a lot of other things on there besides just podcasts. We uh, we answer questions for students and on video and do that sort of thing too. So we got some live seller calls on there that we've that we've done and uh, let you listen to that and that sort of thing. All right, guys, you have a great Saturday. Get on the phone, talk to some sellers, make some money, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. So have a great day.